coming along to this uh, mini lecture as an overview of the Scottish diaspora. I don't know who's out there. Um, to me, I'm just speaking to a camera, which is a rather odd experience. It's much nicer to have a, a visible audience in front of me, but uh, wherever you are, uh, welcome. Um, I'm Marjorie Harper, I'm from the D Department of History, and I coordinate the master's programme in Scottish heritage. So what I'd like to do today is to give you a brief taster of one of the courses within that programme, which is the course on the Scottish diaspora. And we're not going to go into huge detail on any particular dimension of that course. And um, if you're interested, and I hope you will be interested, you can follow that up by actually taking the course. So what I thought we'd do now is just go straight into the um, into the, the, um, the mini lecture, which uh, will last for about 20 minutes. And as we go along, do feel free to uh, post any questions and I will do my best to answer them um, at the end. So um, a brief introduction to the Scottish diaspora. I guess the strap line for this course and, and well, this lecture as well could be um, these uh, six uh, bullet points. The key themes are um, why, how, when, where and so what. I mean, they do, that doesn't correspond to six, but it's um, it's almost the same. Um, Big questions looking at continuities and changes in uh, the terms and what it, what it meant, what they meant um, across the centuries and in different locations. So what I'd like to do is just unpack those bullet points um, a little bit further. The first one um, in terms of, of, of motives really is to do with whether the emigrants jumped or whether they were pushed. Were they uh, driven out of Scotland by lack of opportunity or were they enticed elsewhere? Um, by duty or by a sense that uh, things were much better on the other side of the Atlantic or in the Antipodes, wherever it might be. The photograph that you see on the right hand side of that slide, you can probably read the um, plaque as well. It says the emigrants commissioned by the Clearances Centre in 2004. Now that is up in Helmsdale in Sutherland and there is a parallel statue in Winnipeg in Manitoba and it's meant to depict um, the motives of the emigrants as being very negative. It's associated with the Highland clearances. And that's something that we look at in a fair amount of detail in the course itself. So motives could be positive or negative. Then the second bullet point there, um, mechanisms. In other words, um, what were the processes, the, the devices through which uh, people came to a decision to leave? And how did they then put those decisions um, into practice? And um, how significant was the part played by family or community? Uh, friends, professional agents, shipping companies, the media, um, governments and sponsors in generating interest and actually directing their steps. So those are the sort of mechanisms and I often associate those really with agency recruitment activity. The third bullet point there or the third um, uh, part of the, the, uh, the slide I've called manifestations. Um, and what I really mean there is how was the decision to leave um, manifested in the places to which the, the emigrants went. What were their experiences when they got to their new uh, locations? Um, what determined, for example, whether the, the relocation took the form of a permanent settlement or a temporary sojourn? And um, what were the key experiences of different types of emigrant? You know, we could look at farmers, we could look at domestic servants, children, very controversial category, um, entrepreneurs, investors, soldiers, tradesmen, scholars, a whole range of people. And then the next uh, point is to do with attitudes. Um, what do we learn about contemporary attitudes uh, to emigrants and in, in both the donor country, Scotland, and the host countries to which they went? And how did the press and politicians and um, the affected communities react to either the drain of population, if we're looking at the host, the um, donor country, or the accession of population, if we're looking at uh, the, the new country? Um, did, did, was it seen in, in Scotland and in the UK as a drain of brain and brawn, or was it seen as a safety valve that uh, reduced pressures of overpopulation? Um, were the Scots welcomed into their host countries and communities um, as assets to the economic um, strength um, of the, the, those, those countries and societies, or were they um, disregarded and despised as the redundant dregs of Scotland's um, population? Um, were, was emigration uh, perceived as something that constituted a threat 
um, or an opportunity to participants and to the donor and host community. So there's a whole lot of things you can package into that uh, subheading of, of attitudes. And then linked to that, um, we have uh, the next the penultimate point, um, the impact of the Scots on the places where they settled or sojourned. And then for those who returned, and about a third of those who went out did return, um, what was the impact on the locations in Scotland uh, to which they returned? And then the final point there uh, is to do with legacies. What have been the long term legacies of Scottish emigration um, in terms of um, identity construction, um, as well as the, the social and economic and uh, cultural legacies? Now, as we look at these issues, we have to consider also um, continuities and changes across the centuries. The, the course deals with the 18th to the 20th century or indeed the 18th to the 21st century now. Um, but uh, we have to look at uh, changes and continuities across other centuries as a sort of contextual setting um, in respect of places of origin and destination, um, the background and the occupations of the, the participants, um, the significance of sponsors, the, the mechanisms, um, the nature of transportation, which of course changed hugely as time went on, and the political frameworks uh, within which emigration took place. So what I'd like to do for the rest of the time really, well, they're split into two. And um, part of the, 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 the first half of what I want to say is, is looking at medieval and early modern emigration, which isn't really something we focus on in huge detail in the course, but I think is necessary uh, for us to, to set that context. And then uh, towards the end of time, uh, we'll say a little bit about historiography and about the contested nature of the word uh, diaspora. So. Uh, medieval and early modern emigration from Scotland. What are we talking about here? Well, the late uh, David Fitzpatrick, who's an Irish historian of, of emigration, said that growing up in Ireland meant preparing to leave it. And I think the same thing could be said of Scotland through many, many generations, many, many centuries, because for centuries, um, Scotland has been characterised by the mobility and the wanderlust uh, of its people. And of all the international comings and goings of medieval Scots, I think probably the biggest movement was that, um, it's in the first subheading there, uh, the movement of pilgrims, the constant traffic of pilgrims to the, the, the sites of famous shrines uh, at Rome and Compostela and Jerusalem. Now, not all pilgrims could afford to go so far afield. Um, if they couldn't do, they couldn't afford to cast the net, uh, they might venture to shrines in England uh, or Scotland. And at these shrines, they would be joined by people making the pilgrimage from Europe uh, to England or Scotland. And what we're talking about here um, is the heyday of pilgrimage in the 11th and 12th centuries. Now, pilgrims were not, uh, fairly obviously, were not uh, permanent emigrants. They were sojourners. Um, but although they generally expected to return home, that wasn't always the case. Many of them actually perished uh, in the process when he died on their travels from disease or violence um, or the consequences of war. Now, the, why did they go? Um, well, various reasons then. This is uh, very different from the later periods we'll be, we're looking at uh, in the course as such. Uh, but the motives included things like chivalric service, um, the avoidance of tax, um, a search for healing, uh, fulfillment of a vow, uh, the payment of penance, performance of penance, um, and the maintenance of family honour uh, or social honour. And I think one of the, the recurring threads, which does apply later, of course, is the quest for adventure. It's a very significant ingredient in, for emigrants in, in all eras. Um, another thing about the pilgrims' departure was that it was a very public event. Um, they were given, their bless given a blessing by the local church and accompanied quite often uh, for a distance on the first stage of their journey by friends and neighbours. Um, wealthy pilgrims might make gifts uh, to the local church before they left, uh, those who returned brought back relics and other souvenirs to display uh, in the church or to depict on their heraldic shields and, or to be buried with them. Now, that sense of the departure being a public event is something that uh, is evident from time to time in later generations. And for those of you who know anything about uh, Hebridean emigration in the 19th and 20th centuries, I think that's one of the areas of Scotland where it's most marked. Uh, you may be seeing the footage of the departure of the iconic ship, the Metagama, in 1923, where hundreds of people gathered on the quayside in Stornoway to watch the departure of that ship. So there you have a, a significant continuity. Um, OK, time's moving on, so I won't say any more uh, about uh, pilgrims, but 
um, I think the link, there's a clear link um, between um, pilgrimage and crusade. Uh, crusade was a natural extension of pilgrimage. It was a formalization of pilgrimage. Um, the rights and duties of crusaders were embodied in both canon law uh, and civil law. Um, now, crusades were military campaigns that began after the Muslim capture of Jerusalem in, 12, in 1076. And there were four major crusades over the next uh, four centuries. And Scots took a fairly uh, evident part um, in nearly all the crusades. Uh, Roslyn Chapel near Edinburgh is said to have been a gathering centre uh, at the beginning of the journey. Now, the crusaders didn't necessarily go there in person. Some of the, 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 the so-called crusaders were vicarious crusaders. Uh, for example, King Robert I um, ordered Sir James Douglas uh, to take his heart to, to, to Jerusalem. Uh, but after Douglas fell in battle in, in Andalusia, the king's heart was returned to Scotland for burial um, at Melrose. Um, and, and, and it wasn't actually necessary to, to go yourself. You know, if you had the money, you, you paid uh, by the 13th century. Uh, crusading vows could be commuted for money. Uh, many of the so-called crusaders were actually paid mercenaries. So there's a blurred line between pilgrimage and crusade. Um, crusade, as I say, is a formalization of pilgrimage. There's also a blurred line, and an even, even more blurred line, I think, between uh, crusaders and uh, soldiers probably you've realised that from what I've, I've just said. Um, throughout the, the, the medieval and early modern period, uh, Scots were active as mercenary soldiers in many parts of, of Europe, many theatres of war, uh, not least the Netherlands, um, Sweden, Denmark, Norway and uh, Russia. And there were probably around 25,000 Scots um, in military service in Scandinavia in the first half of the uh, 17th century. And one of my colleagues at St Andrews University has done quite a lot of work um, on that Scandinavian dimension. So pilgrims, crusaders, soldiers, and then another very important category in that uh, medieval and particularly early modern period is uh, the Scottish merchant, because not all Scots who went to Europe uh, were bent on conflict. Uh, trade and commerce um, generated a substantial amount of emigration. Um, those involved ranged from poor itinerant peddlers uh, to wealthy entrepreneurs who operated at a high level um, in the import export business. And there were particularly significant uh, mercantile connections with the Low Countries, with the Netherlands, particularly with the, and with the Baltic, um, and particularly in terms of the Baltic uh, with Poland. Um, in the 16th and 17th centuries, Poland was a key destination for Scottish emigrants. And since um, all commercial activity in Poland was actually left up to foreigners, um, the Scots saw a particular niche and they capitalised on it. And the opportunities for mercantile activity in Poland, for making money in Poland, um, dovetailed with expulsive factors in Scotland in that, that period. Uh, factors like religious and political turmoil, um, harvest failures and famines. And then that, in, in that, again, you have a, you see demonstrated a feature that recurs in the whole story of emigration, this um, dovetailing of expulsive factors, pushing people out of Scotland and attractions that were uh, drawing them elsewhere. Often the mirror image of what was causing the problem in Scotland uh, was evident in the host country. And then finally, in this um, overview, we have scholars, because another group of, of medieval and early modern Scottish emigrants um, followed more cerebral pursuits. Um, in the pre-Reformation era, era, a lot of uh, clerics went to Rome, uh, not least because of, of Scotland's position as a so-called special daughter of the papacy. Uh, that meant that the Scottish bishops were directly answerable to the Pope. But then in the post-Reformation era, you still find uh, Scots going to Europe. Um, many, many uh, Scholars continue to look overseas, particularly to the universities of Leiden and Utrecht uh, in the Netherlands. And then um, by the time we get to the 17th century, <coughs> excuse me, we find increasing uh, numbers of Scots um, turning their attention westwards uh, to Ireland. Um, Highland mercenary soldiers had been active in Ireland, Ireland since the 13th century, way back. And they later fought for the Irish against the Tudors. But what you get in the 17th century is a different type uh, of emigrant to Ireland. In the 17th century, there was a new wave uh, of Scottish settlement um, when you get small tenant farmers from impoverished parts of southwest Scotland in particular 
uh, flocking into Ulster, into the six counties of Ulster, nine counties of Ulster, in fact, um, perhaps to the extent of around 30,000 by 1641. And that's kind of ironic because you're most people know about the Irish famine of the 19th century, but in the 17th century, it was famine in Scotland that was propelling people to Ireland, assisted, of course, by James VI's deliberate policies of plantation. So overall, if we're looking at the first half of the 17th century, Scotland probably lost about 2,000 people a year from an estimated population of between uh, 1 million and 1.2 million. And most of these people were probably young men. So it would have had a significant effect uh, on population growth. Um, we know less about the second half of the 17th century, although we know we do know that the movement to Scandinavia and Poland dried up uh, and didn't recover. Um, but the main destinations by the second half of the century probably remained Ulster, but also um, England. And then to some extent, we have the beginning of movement to America and, and Scots were still going to the, the Netherlands. Um, the uh, second uh, subheading there indicates or reminds us that not all emigrants went away voluntarily. Um, about 2,000 were Cromwellian prisoners of war, uh, prisoners of war from the period of civil war, of turmoil, domestic upheaval in the middle of the 17th century. Um, and then a smaller number of covenanters were, were um, exported, were expelled, uh, transported during the turbulent 1680s. Now, there isn't time to go into detail uh, on any of that. But you do get some people going involuntarily, um, forced out, expelled, political prisoners, religious prisoners in the 17th century. Not all um, were unwilling exiles. Um, others emigrated in pursuit of investment opportunities, such as those who were involved in the colony um, at East New Jersey, the East New Jersey settlement in the 1680s. And of course, the abortive Darien colony um, on the Isthmus of Panama in the 1690s. So the point is that Scots who emigrated in the 18th century, which is when the, our course really begins, by that period, the Scots who emigrated were very well aware, many of them were, that they were building on a firm foundation of mobility. Yes, the destinations were different. The, the eyes turned westwards even more emphatically after the Parliamentary Union of 1707, but the foundation was there, a foundation of um, interest in Europe interest in Ireland and the embryonic interest in the American, what were then the American colonies. So let's move on uh, to the, towards the end of uh, the uh, mini lecture. And I want to say just a little bit, not very much, about the historiography of Scottish emigration, because if I, I, 30 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to give this lecture because nobody would have been interested in the subject. Yes, perhaps genealogists would have been interested, family historians, and a few social historians, but it wasn't really um, a subject that galvanized interest either in academia um, or in, in the popular domain, probably more in the popular domain. The, uh, just since about 1980, though, there has been a huge upsurge of scholarly and popular interest um, in Scottish emigration, and it's generated quite a lot of, of publications. Um, some of the demand, as, as I've hinted, has come from this, this uh, interest in roots uh, from family history societies in Scotland and, and overseas. Um, but increasingly, I think since about 1980, it's been reflected in the, in the academic community. The, the first person to put up a, a flag, if you like, for this kind of study was Gordon Donaldson, um, who was a professor at the University of Edinburgh back in the, the 1960s. And he um, made a case in his inaugural lecture for a new approach to, to Scottish history, which would involve the study of previously uh, neglected issues, including uh, Scotland's overseas connections. Now that was way back in 1966, and it took more than a decade really uh, for things to get going. St um, Gott Donaldson himself wrote a book called The Scots Overseas. Um, we might consider it dated now, but it was the key that eventually unlocked uh, a whole new world of opportunity uh, for others to explore. Um, the first area of interest was really the Highlands, and that was because of writings about the clearances. And you couldn't really write about the clearances without uh, writing about emigration. So you've got people like Jim Hunter, my colleague and friend Jim Hunter, and a number of others uh, writing about clearance and emigration. And then towards the end of the 1980s, an economic historian at Aberdeen called Malcolm Gray introduced a lowland perspective to the story. And he introduced readers to the idea that emigration wasn't always equated with the highlands, 
uh, wasn't always equated with clearance, but involved a much wider, uh, richer tapestry of motives and experiences. And that's where my work uh, started to come in uh, towards the end of the 1980s, when I began to write about the northeast of Scotland and then gradually expanded uh, to other parts of the, the country. OK, um, I could say a lot more about uh, the historiography, but just, oh, just one final point before I move on to the final slide. And that's to say that um, I think there's been a, a, a major shift over the decades um, in the study of emigration. And it's a, it's a shift that's, that's applicable to Scotland, but it's relevant beyond Scotland. Um, we've seen a shift since the 1980s away from viewing and writing emigration history through the cabinet office window or the colonial office window um, to a more kind of grassroots uh, bottom up approach. Um, as the sun has set on the British Empire, so it set on the aggressively imperialistic um, Anglo centric approach. It uh, moved away from the study of great men and their achievements. Um, and as we've done that, the voices of individual migrants have increasingly been heard. And it's those voices that we seek to bring to the fore um, in the course on the Scottish diaspora. And then finally, um, I just want to flag up the uh, use of the term diaspora, uh, which is a contested term. And how should we handle this uh, semantically um, hot potato? Because there's no consensus um, about what it means. Um, one school of thought um, declares that the Greek word uh, diaspora is uh, synonymous with the Hebrew word galut, G-A-L-U-T, which signifies exile, and it's a word that therefore should be applied exclusively uh, to the enforced dispersions of the, the Jewish people. And um, that exilic motif, motif um, was later uh, adopted by both Black and Armenian studies constituencies to describe their respective experiences of banishment uh, and homesickness. So that was how it was initially regarded. But by the 1990s, in the 1990s rather, um, the term was re-examined and it was given a, a broader application. Notably, scholars began to define uh, the term diaspora in terms of its original Greek meaning as a dispersal, a scattering, um, a dispersal of population through colonization. And they used it to refer to the uncontroversial nature of uh, or the uncontroversial preservation of ethnic identities among voluntary migrants, not those who were forced to go. Um, now, since then, since the 1990s, the term diaspora, uh, particularly the, not just in respect of Scottish emigration, but emigration studies more generally, um, the term diaspora has become co common currency in the study of population movement, um, perhaps because of the imprecision and the unsatisfactory connotations of using terms like push and pull, which are, are fairly simplistic, or even migration itself has a, a, a kind of a fuzzy meaning. Uh, now, current interpretations of diaspora tend to include both traumatic and forced dispersal and uh, willing self-determined uh, relocation. And just finally, to, to uh, flag up what I would see and what a number of other scholars would see as a uh, what constitutes a diaspora and, and you link, how, to, how you link that to individual migrants and groups of migrants. A migrant's claim to be part of a diaspora involves things like an awareness of a group identity, a desire to maintain some sort of relationship with the place of origin, whether that's by writing letters home or by joining a Scottish society or by making return visits. It can be any number of things but it's a desire to maintain a relationship. So an awareness of a group identity, a desire to maintain a relationship with the place of origin and a determination to impl implant characteristics um, of the homeland into the host land. Um, so how do you do this? Well, you might form regional or community or family networks. You might, you might join those networks or you might indeed create them yourself. Um, religious, social, cultural or linguistic identities might be cultivated as well. Um, migrants who come from families or communities with a long tradition of uh, wanderlust uh, might have an inbuilt uh, diasporic consciousness that predates their decision to emigrate and perhaps triggers that decision uh, to emigrate. Um, others wait until they are in a new land uh, before they begin to construct uh, a self-conscious ethnic identity. Um, perhaps that happens when the absence of their default culture makes them feel a bit uncomfortable, makes them more aware of the significance of that default culture. 
Um, some, may, uh, some migrants favor the idea of a corporate identity, which might involve a semi-invented or even a fictional uh, world of collective memory. And that collective memory is most commonly associated with victimhood. And I'm thinking here particularly of the Highland Clearances. And other examples of the sense of diaspora might in involve the production of reflective or nostalgic memoirs uh, by migrants, particularly women. Um, migrants who, who, if they hadn't migrated, would never actually have thought of putting uh, pen to paper. And finally, um, and alternatively, uh, diasporic memories are not necessarily constructed by the migrant generation. They might be constructed and quite often are constructed by generations further down the line, um, by those who uh, draw on family letters or artefacts or public memorials. So there's a whole range of things that you can look at in terms of migrant identity and the significance of diaspora. And a lot of these uh, we return to um, in the course uh, as such. And the final slide um, just gives you an outline of the course. Um, we, we look, it's really split into uh, what three, the causes and consequences, the mechanisms and experiences of moving and the types of emigration. And uh, if you, anybody's interested in knowing more about it, I'm very happy to answer questions either now or um, in uh, email correspondence uh, later. So thank you very much for coming along. And if there are any questions, I will do my best to uh, answer them. Thank you very much, Marjorie. We have two questions in the chat currently. Um, so the first question is from Niall. And the question is, how did Scottish diaspora affect economic development of Scotland in the past? Um, in various ways, Niall. Um, as I mentioned at, the, at some point in that mini lecture, about a third of people who emigrated returned to Scotland and many of them actually repatriated capital. So a lot of the money that had been made overseas was ultimately re was invested uh, back in Scotland. And you find evidence of this in, well, in a number of sources, but not least in what's known as the, the, the two statistical accounts of the 1790s and the 1840s. Uh, these were parish by parish accounts of uh, economic social progress or, or the state of parishes in Scotland, if you like, compiled by the parish minister. And a number of those, recount, of those accounts referred to um, how money that had been made overseas was used in the building up of the economy of that particular parish. Now, that might be um, somebody who returned and, and invested in land, um, using the money to improve the, the, the farmland, to, to go for, in for enclosures or um, just an in investment in, in what was known as the agricultural revolution, the commercialization of agriculture. And what the, the, the person that springs to mind here, for me anyway, is a man called Hector Munro of Navarre, who came back from India uh, to his estate at Edmonton in Easter Ross and used the money he'd made, actually it was prize money from military activity in India, uh, to improve that estate. Um, public buildings in places like, well, again, the place that comes to mind is Elgin, Dr. Gray's Hospital in Elgin, the Anderson Institute in Elgin, both built with money that had been made out in India. Um, a common practice of, uh, of sojourning emigrant sojourners from Scotland was to engage with the Hudson's Bay Company or the North West Company. By the, by the 20th, 19th century, the Hudson's Bay Company had taken over um, from the NWC, so it's all Hudson's Bay. And they were generally engaged for five year terms, which were often renewable, dependent on age and, and ability and, and, and health. But many of these people came back. Uh, the, a lot of them came from the Northern Isles, particularly from Orkney. And the money they made as their wages from working for her, the, the fur trade would be sent back home, usually fairly small scale this was, to pay the rent of a farm or pay the rent of a business back in somewhere like Kirkwall. So it kept family economies uh, going. Uh, of course, there were bigger investments as well, but men like William Thomason, who made a lot of money and uh, funded uh, educational and, and poor relief ventures um, in Orkney. So the e effect on the economy could be positive in that sense. Of course, there's a lot more controversial. There are many more controversial elements to that uh, if you take into account the, the, the link with slave ownership and the money that had been made out on slave plantations, sugar plantations in the Caribbean um, being brought back to Scotland or sent back to Scotland to build up the infrastructure of 
um, you know, the, the merchant city of Glasgow, for example, many of the, the, the buildings in the merchant city built using money made by um, slave owners or um, people investing in those, uh, buying estates back in Scotland and, and, and money there uh, that had come from, from slave ownership. So a, there's a very controversial element to it as well. On a smaller scale, um, you get you know, some of my 19th century examples, people who'd uh, made better a better life for themselves in farming in Canada, sending back, or whatever it might be, I'll just give Canada as the example because it was the main destination for a long time, sending back remittances um, to help uh, keep the family uh, at home um, above, keep their heads above the, the bread line in terms of paying rent um, and so forth. But on the other hand, just I'll, I'll finish the, my point in a minute or two, I don't want to go on too long, but just if you flip the coin, um, the, 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 the other side of it was concern that Scotland was being drained of its its um, the flower of its population by the fact that so many of the the most entrepreneurial um, far sighted people were emigrating and taking their money with them. And in the 18th century, the, the, when the, the the dominant philosophy was that of mercantilism, there was a huge concern about the number of people who were emigrating, particularly from the Highlands. We often think of the Highlands as being somewhere where people were pushed out. But in the 18th century, there was huge concern on the part of government and landowners that so many people were leaving and taking their capital with them. Because in that age, the, the philosophy was that the national wealth was vested in the whole population, as big a population as possible, keeping their, um, their uh, assets at home. So there was always this sort of dilemma and dichotomy. W was Scotland being benefited or um, deprived by uh, the, the, the departure of people? I mean, it's a huge question and I could spend an hour on it and I spent too long on this already. But uh, if you want to know more, I'm happy to answer questions by email. Thank you very much. And the other question that we have in the chat is, do you think Scottish diaspora helped to educate people about Scottish identity, heritage and culture? Um, it's a variable pattern, I think. One thing that tends to happen, has tended to happen when people leave, is that their image of the country that they've left becomes frozen in a sort of time warp. It's frozen in a, in a still, if you like, at the time of their departure. And unless they keep coming back to Scotland for regular visits, they don't realise that Scotland itself has changed. So there is this sense in which the image of Scotland that is portrayed or peddled by those who've gone overseas is a distorted image of Scotland, which is either the Scotland that these people knew at the time of their departure or possibly an invented Scotland, which never ever existed, even at the time they departed, but, but, but which gains uh, traction and credence in their own minds at the longer they've been away, because nostalgia starts to creep in and, and creates this sense of um, uh, of, of longing or of, of I, it's either it's either nostalgia or it's victimhood. But that's that's only one side of the, the coin. And yes, um, one way in which Scots have demonstrated their ethnic identity is through the what we call associational culture, uh, Burns clubs, um, Caledonian societies, Highland games, and then very localized sort of associational culture. The, the creation of bodies like the Lewis Society of Detroit or the Fraserburgh Society of Winnipeg, um, where people from a very small area really have got together and um, want to demonstrate their, their identity in um, communal gatherings and sometimes it, not really exclusively usually they, they are open to uh, portraying their identity to to other parts of, of the communities in which they settle but i think i think the image of scotland that is sometimes portrayed overseas and i don't in the past anyway it has been this kind of um bastardized image of Scotland that it's a sort of um image an, an imaginary Scotland this that my fa one of my favorite stories is the one of the producer of the first film of Brigadoon who came from Hollywood to, to Scotland to find a place where he could make the film Brigadoon and he went back to Hollywood and made it there went back from Scotland disappointed 
And his famous comment is, I came to Scotland, but I could find nowhere that looked like Scotland. So he had this kind of image of what Scotland ought to be. But it's, it's not just something that replies to the diaspora. I mean, you can trace its origins at least back to the Romantic movement of the 19th century, the early 19th century, and to the Scotland that was portrayed by people like Sir Walter Scott in that age of Romanticism. But that takes us down a whole different track of uh, looking at literature. And we've had another question that's just come through from the chat. Um, somebody is asking, as people emigrated away from Scotland to work overseas, was there risk of losing Scottish heritage and identity? Oh yes, I think there was. I mean, the, the way that we normally uh, sort of categorise or divide attitudes is whether people adapted, integrated or assimilated. That's, those are the sort of three, well, I suppose there's a fourth one, um, alienated. Um, the, the, the ways in which people adjusted to new lands and new ways of living. Some simply adapted, they, they remained Scottish and where they were generally, these were people who would be homesick, uh, who would probably return as often as they could or perhaps return permanently if they if they could. They just adapted as much as they could to the, uh, as far, uh, did, the, the, did the minimum in terms of getting on in the new land. The next category would be those who integrated, who uh, got on with their new lives, made the most of their new lives, but retained a sense of where they had come from, of a of an identity um, that they might uh, put on and off as they would put on, a, on and off a coat, uh, so that you probably um, cultivating their Scottish identity through associational culture, which might be secular in the Burns clubs or the Caledonian societies, or very often, and certainly up until the early 20th century, was often religious in terms of the Scottish churches that they joined or formed, or the Scottish type schools with the Scottish type curriculum. Um, and ministers, would, uh, would, church ministers would be brought in from Scotland uh, to uh, minister to um, uh, their Scottish flocks uh, overseas. So that would be integration, where they made the most of, of being wherever they were in terms of the, the practicalities, the, the, the work opportunities, um, but their social life uh, often involved an element of retaining ethnic identity. The third element would be those who assimilated. In other words, they uh, wanted to rid themselves of everything that reminded them of the place from which they'd come. Maybe not sort of in a, in a nasty sort of way, but, but just wanted to be part of this place, uh, new place to which they had gone. And they kind of jettisoned their Scottish identity. Um, I've done quite a lot of interviewing and my, my, I've got a book out of, of uh, interviews with, with people, over 100 interviews. And I, I'm very struck by two people in particular, both of whom went to Vancouver in the 1950s. One of them was a, a man from the Hebrides, from the Outer Hebrides, and for, for him, retaining his connection with his native land, with his native parish, was very, very important to him throughout his life. Um, he was there from 1953, died a couple of years ago, and he joined the Gallic Society of Vancouver. He was chieftain of that society three times. He retained his, his accent, he retained his, his, um, his, not only his accent, but his Gallic language. And very, be, even though he was out in the Pacific Northwest, it was hugely important to him to remain part of, uh, um, of Scotland to retain his Hebridean heritage. But in the same era, also in the 1950s, another interviewee of mine um, went out from Glasgow. He was a steel worker in, in Glasgow and he went out to Vancouver and he said, when we got there, we were invited to join the Scottish Society. And he said, hmm, no way was he going to go along to that. He said, we thought there were a maudlin lot. Um, he says we came to Canada to make new friends and that so we deliberately shed uh, you know our any desire to be involved with with fellow Scots and again somebody else I interviewed said when he went to Toronto in the 1970s he said I avoided Scottish pubs like the plague he says because they were peddling this sort of tartan imagery that to him was not anything like what Scotland uh, really was and one of the ways you can uh, get an insight into this is by, well, to some extent anyway, it's not foolproof, but listening to people's accents, whether they have retained their Scottish accent or lost their Scottish accent. Now, I think it's to, to a large extent, it's whether you have a, an ear that's attuned to where you are and, and, a, and a skill or lack of it for mimicry. But I spoke to a professor of linguistics out in, in New Zealand and he said, it's actually deliberate. If you want to be seen as part of your new society, um, you uh, converge, you, you, you adopt the accent of the place to, to which you've gone so that you're not noticed. If you want to be distinctive and say, yes, I'm a Scot and I'm different, 
then you diverge. He says it's, the terms are convergence and divergence. And he said, even if you don't realize it, it is actually a deliberate decision. Um, children, of course, often converge more uh, readily than their parents. But again, I, one of my interviewees said, well, I kept on speaking like a Scot when I was in at home. But when I went into the school playground, I spoke like my fellow pupils so that I wouldn't be singled out and bullied. So lots of uh, lots of variety, I think, on that uh, in the answer to that question. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, there isn't any more questions in the chat currently, so I think that'll be all the questions for today. Just to make everyone aware, um, this little lecture as part of all the little lectures in the series are being recorded and they will all be available on demand on the little lectures webpage and also on the University of Aberdeen YouTube channel if you want to watch back. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just seeing if there is another question in the chat. Yes, there is. So we have an, another question um, from Morag and they say, my cousin married a Dane they met on a boat. So if Scots married other nationalities, how did that affect their relationship with Scotland? I think it would depend very much on the individual and the family composition. I, um, Scots have always been citizens of the world. I mean, I think obviously if you if you marry fellow Scots, you're your Scot sense of Scottish identity is going to be less diluted than if you marry outside that Scottish community. But um, I mean, in, in many of the places to which they went, uh, Scots did marry uh, people from from the places they went and from other uh, locations to which those people had it, had um, immigrated. So, you know, take somewhere like cosmopolitan city like Toronto, they you, you could marry well, you could marry a Dane, you could marry somebody from any part of Europe, any part of the world, as well as, as Canadian, fellow Canadians. Depended on really where you, um, well, I suppose serendipity had a lot of, had a part to play in it. And meeting somebody in the boat is serendipitous. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll get to closing remarks just now. Um, uh, Marjorie, if you have any, thank you for today and thank you everyone for, for joining us as well. Okay, well, thank you very much to everybody who's joined in and thank you very much for your, your questions, which are very, very searching questions. And as I say, what I've done is just try to give a little taster of the context of Scottish emigration and its the historiographical background that underpins it. But um, that final slide gives you some sort of idea of what we were, were trying to do in the course itself. The course itself covers the period from the mid 18th century through to the end of the 20th century. Um, and it, it deals with various um, ways in which we can we can look at the topic. And I think because it's a topic about people, um, it's always evolving. It's, it's it's not static. So I'd be delighted to welcome anybody onto the course, um, which starts at, uh, on the 25th of January next year. So thank you very much for coming along. <laughs>